The following interview was conducted with Carolyn Johnson, Interim Chief Diversity Officer for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, March the 9th, 2009 in Stewart B26. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Carolyn. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about where and when you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. All right. I was born in Indiana. I'm a Hoosier. I was born in Indianapolis in October of 1947, October the 6th to be precise. Uh, I grew up as a, always say I grew up as an only child. My brother actually was born when I was 17, so I was about to head off to college when I have a new brother, uh, which was an experience in of itself, wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, my parents, I was very fortunate. I knew all my great grandparents and all my great grandparents. Wonderful. Yeah, it really, really was wonderful. Um, Where'd you go to grade school and high school? Tell in, us about that. In Indianapolis, our grade schools were not only named, but they were numbered. So I went to PS 43, which was on Illinois and uh, 40th Street, but it was also James Wickham Riley School. So as a result, all the classes every year had to learn some poem by James Wickham Riley. And we had a Riley Days uh, uh, festival every year, so that was a, a wonderful way to know something about one of our uh, famous Leading Hoosiers. Leading Hoosier authors, right. Yes, Hoosier yes. authors. Um, when I was young, uh, my, as I said, my mother and father divorced when I was very small, and my mother remarried, and so, uh, which turned out to be a wonderful thing because in addition to my biological father and his family, then I also had this wonderful stepfather and his family. So many times when I say my father, I have visualized one of the two people in my mind and I always have to say to other people, oh, this is my father, Scott, or this is my father, Johnson. But in each case, uh, two wonderful families. So I, I couldn't have been more fortunate as a child. Yeah. Now tell us what about high school. When you, where did you go to high school? Tell Went to Short Ridge High School. Okay. And Short Ridge has had many um, uh, changes over its time period. But the time I went, it was in a, a time period where it was a college preparatory school. And so it did a lot of very uh, unique things for the time. So one of the, uh, we all had to take, of course, as students do, take foreign languages. But one of the programs they did uh, when I was in school was to uh, have a whole week where you could only speak the language you were taking, you know, for your high school uh, credit. And so all your classes were changed around so that any student, who, as I was doing, who was doing French, you were all together for math. You were all together for geography. It was chaos, but it was great. And so uh, it, was a, it was a good experience. I enjoyed my high school. And that high school was named after one of the former presidents of Purdue it University. It really was. That was my first um, knowledge of Purdue, actually. Yeah, yeah so. they sort of told you about that, huh? Yes. <laughs> so, well, we had plenty of pictures of Short Ridge in our, our <laughs> building. And uh, lots of famous people had gone to Short Ridge over over a period sure. of time. So. Was that close to where you live? Or yes, it wasn't that far. Uh, we were I was still able to walk to school. I lived on 36th and Graceland at that time, and Short Ridge was on 34th and Illinois. So it was uh, 34th and Meridian, I yeah. mean, 34th Meridian. The original one is, doesn't exist in the one you went to. Is that, am I correct in that? Um, or I don't think way? it's still, the building is there, okay. but I think something else is there. The uh, But the doors of the school when I was there actually came from the original Short Ridge building, which I believe had been closer to the downtown area. Right, and named after mm -hmm. the, the president. Mm -hmm. thing. Okay, mm -hmm. then what came next? Tell us a little about your college life and what, yes, you know, how I, you decided to go, where you went. Yes, I was went to Indiana University, so I always say I'm Hoosier born and bred. Um, it was not my first choice, actually, as a, I just was very sure that I was either going to go to the University of Utah because I had spent some time in Utah as a, as a smaller child, love Utah, or I thought I might go to a traditionally black college somewhere in the south of the U.S. Uh, part of my family wanted me to do the HBCU. Another part wanted me to do the Utah experience. And IU was so close, so I just really never considered it until uh, we had one of a group that I was in went to a uh, preview day at Indiana University. And I absolutely loved it. I just thought, this is wonderful. And then uh, it was at the same time, I always wanted to be a teacher. I have, um, I think I had my first school when I was six years old. I always wanted to be a teacher. And the Ford Foundation at Indiana University had teamed up to create a new program called Instructional Systems and Teacher Education. What they wanted to do was to see if they could change the way elementary teachers taught 
by giving them a very strong liberal arts education instead of the traditional education and just pedagogy. And so you had to apply for that idea, and I, I was very fortunate to uh, be selected as one of the uh, Insight Fellows. And so that just sealed the IU deal for me. So, Super. Yeah. 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 Tell us a little about where you live on campus and some of your activities and things. I did. I really did. Lived on campus, loved it. I uh, lived in a dorm that was, that was the year we had, uh, I'm a baby boomer, at okay. the front end of the baby boomers. And there were a record number of girls who went to IU, so much so that one of the male dorms had to be turned into a female dorm. So um, that must have been interesting. It was. I must say, I was a, a, a naive young woman. So the first time I went into the um, uh, restroom and discovered, oh, there are things in here that I don't normally see <laughs> in restrooms. But they thing. became great flower pots. So we were. <laughs> so that there you was. Go. Yeah, and it was a, a wonderful experience of um, meeting students, uh, you know, from around the world. But particularly, um, it, again, I went to school in the '60s, so. In terms of race relations, this was a brand new time, and I remember a um, a conversation my roommate and I had that um, her parents had received a letter asking them if they would agree uh, for their child to have a black roommate. And I remember asking my parents if they had gotten that kind of a letter, and they had not. Um, and so uh, that didn't... Um, huh. It didn't make me um, angry, but it was just something that got filed away in that place where you pull out much later when you're, you're gotcha. reflecting on yeah. things. Yeah. But again, it was, um, you know, institutions always do what seems best at the time. But as a result, it did mean that I had some opportunities, um, you know, that I might not have had normally. And so good questions, good interaction. So it was a it was a really good experience for right. me. Uh, that uh, Ford thing did that last for all four years you were there? Uh, it, did. it did, okay. and actually the program was designed so that you were only on campus for three years, that you would complete your bachelor's degree in the third year. You had to agree to go to school in the summers, and that you would do an applied uh, residency. So you would do an internship, uh, much like student teaching, during that three year period. And then you would agree to do a fourth, your fourth year would be not doing your regular coursework because you've already graduated with your bachelor's degree, but you would do an accelerated master's program of which the first semester would be as a residential teacher in a regular school district. So as far as your colleagues knew in the school district, you were just another professional, yeah. Yeah. but you were doing documentation, you were having visits from the IU faculty, uh, it was a wonderful research project, and most of us ended up staying for the full year and then completed that master's that summer. Um, That's so a the, good program. That's like a great it program. It was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful program, and I, uh, I think it really launched me into um, how I understood teaching and how I also wanted to be someone who helped t teach teachers. Sure. What what level were you teaching? Uh, high school or no, elementary school? Oh. Fifth grade. Okay. Fifth grade. That's an interesting year. It is an interesting year. Um, fifth is very much like second grade in that it's one of those high points in your life where all the skills you've had previously come together. So now you've got all, you've got writing and reading, all those skills are pretty honed very well. And now you're ready to tell your story and, and you have lots of things to say. It's a wonderful, wonderful time. Yeah, as you get ready for junior high school. Exactly. That's right. Now then, uh, what came after that, Did, after you finished that? You didn't start your graduate education until later, though, right? No, I started graduate education later. I, um, as I said, I was teaching in Elkhart. And um, Elkhart was... After you got your master's. After I got my master's. And that was also where I did my, my that residency semester, so that was very helpful. Elkhart, at the time, was called the Little Giant. Uh, so it's been interesting to watch in recent weeks uh, it being portrayed because, of course, it's changed dramatically in terms of the economic situation right. it was in. But at the time I was in Elkhart, there were 40,000 residents and more than 40 millionaires. And so they had the highest uh, per capita of mil millionaires per, per capita in the nation. So it was a school. What a change. Yeah, what a change. It was a, it was a system that had, lo and a community that had lots of resources, but it also really tapped on its human resources. And so as an elementary teacher, 
Uh, I was asked to be on the United Way board. There were many boards and agencies that people could serve on. So the, the volunteer spirit was really very strong in Elkhart. And it was, um, again, that and many things that were happening in um, other groups I was working with, particularly church groups. All of that volunteer experience, I didn't realize at the time it was laying a base for a much um, more in-depth form of volunteerism much later. Right. Sounds good. And then, well, then what came after that, after you finished? Didn't you, is that when you came to Purdue? Uh, yes, I okay. did. I came to Purdue. Uh, how did you happen to decide to, how did that come about? Well, again, I, I have been so fortunate to have these moments that were just the perfect moment. I was uh, teaching in Elkhart, and Purdue was doing a project that, uh, with Larry Sinish from, uh, he had been both here and in Colorado, uh, along with Elise Boldy. So it was a, you know, a very... Uh, top group of people, they were doing a project on creativity. And so when they came to uh, visit our school district, they wanted to talk to teachers about um, what kind of things you did around creativity and what you were doing with your students. And because I had been in this insight program, I had done a lot of um, interesting things with the students. So uh, full week simulation so that they could really apply their skills. So we had a farm game and an international trade game. The students had parts and roles. But that's how they, they synthesized their math and their reading and their science skills. Uh, but uh, so I wish I could say it was just that I was this brilliant teacher, which I, I, I thought I was a good teacher. But what happened was the day that um, the Purdue team came, they were questioning all the teachers doing this inventory about how creative we were. And it made um, made probably most of us somewhat nervous. And so the more people tried to respond in ways that they thought the team would think were creative, the less creative they probably sounded. I was the last one. So having watched all this, I thought, you know, I think I'll just relax and just say kind of crazy off the wall things. They won't like me. They'll be finished with me and it'll be finished. It'll be over. Uh, that strategy backfired. They thought I was the most creative person because I being just, last was the best. I'm just saying great thing, right? And as it happened, uh, uh, Dr. Sinish just said, you know, you should really consider coming to Purdue because um, Purdue has a lot of space for both creativity and for a kind of Midwest common sense. And when he said that, it was as though that just opened up a whole new field of possibilities for me because on one hand, that was exactly my personality. On one hand, I like to think of myself as a very organized, common sense, very anchored person. But the other part of me is kind of blue sky thinking, creative. And when the he merge. said there was space for both of those to exist together as one package, but yeah, this maybe this is the time to, to, to think about graduate school. And I always knew I wanted a Ph.D. Um, there was not any problem with the EDD by any means, but for some reason I wanted a Ph.D. And there were very few schools in the Midwest that did the Ph.D., and uh, Purdue was one of those. So it just seemed to be the right moment to come to Purdue, yeah. and it was, um, it, was, it, was, it was good for me. Yeah. And then, uh, so you got your, you finished there in 85, and then, I did. then what, uh, what came next before you came back to Purdue? Uh, well, when I finished in 85, there was a time I left for two years to do a um, kind of a residency in the Dallas School District, okay. uh, which was a, a u very unique thing because normally um, in our PhD programs, we don't have that kind of residency in, in education. But I, um, Dallas, it was, again, it was a time my field was school desegregation, and it was a time where so many school districts were desegregating and having lots of different issues. So I had received a call from someone in the Dallas Independent School District asking me if I were willing to come and do some administrative work, particularly on the Emergency School Aid Act, which was designed for school districts who were undergoing desegregation uh, in desegregation plans, but specifically to look at um, reading issues, mathematics issues, and to be able to deal with students on kind of larger synthesis kind of pieces, so starting very early. And, and also because the classrooms were going to be intentionally uh, structured to be diverse. And in Dallas, there was a formula of how many um, African Americans, how many Hispanics, how many uh, whites would be in the classrooms, how many in the buildings. So they really wanted to see, would this make a difference yeah. in a kind of multicultural setting? And so I did that, uh, and I still was enrolled here, so I did that for two years, which really impacted then 
of the way I did my dissertation work. Right. That was a good experience. Another yeah. good experience. Things are just working very well. Yeah, for they you. really do. They, they really. <laughs> I, I really don't have complaints in that area. Yeah. Now I think let's move on to the African American Studies and Research Center that you got started. Is that where you first came here? It when is. You came back? Okay. It is the Senior is. Research Associate. It is. And and it, yeah, I know you mentioned teaching. Let's talk a little bit about that and. That symposium was pretty good in 2000, that path to leadership. Yes, yes. Um, when I came in 85, we had a brand new director, um, and one of the things that she wanted to do was to move the program, to elevate it so that it would be um, somewhat different than African American Studies programs or Black Studies programs at that time around the country. Many Black Studies programs grew out of an era of um, Students, of course, wanting to know more about their history, but there was also a component to many programs of um, trying to bring students together to, to really just talk and have conversation. And so it wasn't unusual for many of these programs to be considered um, conversational groups, conversational programs. Okay. But to say, you know, this is a real body of work, and we need to really look at uh, taking the courses and making them real courses and also making sure that we do what R1 universities do. We produce knowledge. And so we changed the name to the African American Studies and Research Center. And my job as the senior research associate was to craft the types of research projects we do to develop activities that would lead to scholarly work, uh, one of which was to create an annual symposium on um, African American life, work, and studies. And so that was one of the things that I did to pursue uh, extramural funding so that we could do some of the kind sure. of projects we were interested in. And so that's how that whole portfolio of work came to be. Was before that was it uh, before you came was it called was it called that center at that time or It wasn't or you, called a center at that time um, it was just called the Black Studies Program. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. And so then they changed the name to the mm -hmm. center then. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh tell us a little just a little bit about the center itself uh as it operated you probably addressed that. Was there any curriculum? Did you do some courses yes, too? Yes, uh, I did. Uh, we, we started off with only three courses, and so uh, it was an introduction to African American studies and then one on topics, variable topics. Um, and then there was a course that, was, that didn't last very long. It was developed on black economics, and that one just didn't last long. So what I wanted to do was when I came in then to work as research associate and later during different periods of time as interim directors, director to try to see if we couldn't really get our curriculum uh, up to speed so that we could truly pursue offering a major and a minor and we, we were able to do yeah. that so I had an opportunity to help develop courses as well as to teach courses right. so I uh, developed the course the last course that I developed uh, was called um, Black Women Rising and it was to specifically look at African American women from a time period uh, of about um, 1890 through 1940. It was a, a time in the U.S. which generally is called the Black Women's Club Movement. And so there's a lot of um, research work that's a part of that course. Uh, so it's, it was a really good piece for us to then be able to move from the 100 and 200 level courses to the introduction of a 300 level course. Right. And then I also helped write a course called Soul Plus Radio Magazine, which was an applied course and we worked with WBAA and literally produced a radio show um, called Soul Plus Radio Magazine where we could uh, find a way to have some of these issues and topics presented to the larger community so that they would again have a, uh, an understanding of what African American studies was. Yeah, that's good. And this gave you, to keep on with the teaching is what you yes. really like, which worked out yes. very well. Then uh, was the next thing is a diversity resource office uh, you have been the director since. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and the activities and things. Yes, the Diversity Resource <laughs> Office, uh, at the time that I came into the position, was housed in the Vice President for Human Relations Office. Um, its, its mission originally was to um, be the place on campus that encouraged and administered, assessed, developed programs that really celebrated the climate of diversity at Purdue. And so uh, when I came on board, it had been without a director for almost three years, um, yeah, for a long period of time. And so there had been some ideas that had been generated, but they were just that. They were ideas or they were fragments of programs. And so one of the first tasks I had to do, uh, in addition to trying to create some things to make it very much holistic and comprehensive, was at least to get some of those things off the ground. And so we were able to do that. One of those was the Diversity Program. 
And diversity was... Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you that about oh. that. All right, good. Sorry, yeah. well, diversity... No, no, go ahead. That, diversity uh, was the, actually came out of a challenge uh, to Iron Key Club, so that students at Iron Key uh, felt it was really important to find ways to incorporate students to work, to have a way to really address diversity issues and to learn more about diversity issues. Diversity Key is really good because it really lifts up uh, probably a second part of diversity work that isn't shared a lot. And that is, so many times we think of diversity work as in a way of empowering the minority person to be able to find a, um, an institution more inclusive for them. But the other part, it's a dual piece, it's also educating the majority on what are some of the issues and because all of us are, all of us have uh, multiple identities of, of a sort. You know, all these things intersect race and gender and rural. So one of us might be black and one of us might be white, but maybe we both grew up in a small town. You know, and so we have those kind of intersecting things, points of commonality and difference. Right. And so that those differences aren't deficits. But what was important was, particularly with diversity, uh, because it was it was the, begun by students in terms of the initial idea, the there was a good marketing plan on how to really reach students. And the marketing plan was, this is something you're really going to need and can be a wonderful skill to participate in when you leave the work when you leave the university and take it to the workplace. So diversity. Diversity is a certificate program. Students um, participate, they earn 50 to 60 points, and those points then, if they earn them all, enable them to get a, trans a notation on their transcript that they have engaged in a significant uh, set of diversity work, some of which is as easy as attending programs, others relate to uh, community involvement and community service work and service learning. Others are things that they would, would write about or do small research projects in so that we can say to an employer, if this person has a diversity key certificate, you can be sure you could assign them to work in Mumbai, you can assign them to work in Beijing, or they can work in downtown Detroit. They can work wherever they, they need to and understand the issues around um, uh, workplace diversity. Is that still going? It's still going. Right. It's going very well. Now, the other one was that uh, the Diversity Fellows Program, too. Yes. Right. Uh, and again, <clears throat> in the Diversity Resource Office, we tried to take a very comprehensive approach. So Diversity is designed for students. The Diversity at Work Program designed for staff. And again, um, the, the staff are an integral part. You know, we always think of faculty, which are clear, you know, the, the core of the university. But staff are a major part of the university right. too, and in a in big component. Big component, right. and in many cases, um, particularly a student is uh, while a student will engage with a faculty person in class, but they're going to relate to staff people in many many ways on a, a daily basis. Sometimes it's the first person they contact when they go into the registrar's office, or in a dormitory, or in a you know in one of the um, housing facilities, or in a restaurant. And so uh, given the large number of international students we have also, we really felt it was important to provide an opportunity for staff to be able to participate in uh, diversity training programs and then to show the, the kind of breadth that we have. So we have some general courses in diversity at work, but now we're moving into things like generational diversity, which is much less race-based than it is on how do the generations differ when they uh, interact at the workplace. Right, and that was a couple of programs, and the uh, one, a couple of ones that conducting the, the interviews, uh, quality interviews, and a guide to reference checking. Those are some programs that you've been offering too. Yes, and the diversity in the workplace, which is which I attend, which is quite good, mm -hmm. and then that the. Diversity and as part of that classroom project, the diversity yes. fellows. Yes, we did that, and that was the one specifically to faculty as an incentive to say, um, you know, sometimes when you're teaching, you teach the same course again and again and again, and so we said, you know, this is an incentive to be able to perhaps buy books, go to a conference, bring someone in, but to look at the courses you're currently teaching and see if they really are as expansive as they could be when it comes to diversity. Or perhaps there's a course you've been thinking about teaching and you haven't had time to sit out and get all the research done or get all the books or things that you need. And so here's a monetary incentive to help you do that. And so that's been, and we do a symposium at the conclusion of each year 
to hear the, the work that's been done, and that's been really rewarding. Yeah. The um, funding for that, is that coming from, do you, do you have external funding? Uh, no, it's internal Inter funding. Okay. What we, we did originally was uh, it was a partnership between the deans and the vice president for human uh, resources, yeah. human relations, I'm sorry. Right. The other one was that, I was going to ask about Mosaic, that, uh, that program. Yes. That, uh, that's still going, of course. It, Mosaic is still going, and that is actually in my direct responsibility as chief diversity officer, because that that work is lodged in the office of the provost. Right, and uh, Dr. M uh, Dr. Mason was involved pretty yes. much, and I went to some of those programs. Um, now let's move on to that vice Pro provost for diversity and inclusion and the chief diversity officer. That's something new. Yes, it is. You make some it's general comments. Two thousand and nine. <laughs> yes, it's brand new. Right. Uh, during a p part of the um, previous year, when the strategic plan was being developed. It was very clear that there were, were some spaces that needed a little more um, visibility and a higher level positioning in the university if it was going to make sure that the overall strategic plan was to be accomplished. So one of those was personnel services, of course, with human re resources, but another one was diversity. And so um, and that's when it was recommended that there be a chief diversity officer as well as uh, an interim vice provost for diversity. So I'm doing that role as an interim, and, w and then there's a search currently going on. The position title has now changed to vice Pro provost for diversity and inclusion. And again, it's to work at a, um, a level, not so much as the um, program level of terms of that piece, but really how do you bring uh, collaboration and coherence to all of the diversity work we have, particularly in such a decentralized organization as we are. All right. Okay. Well, that sounds, that's a challenge. It is a challenge. <laughs> right. Now, the United Methodist Church that uh, you're the president of women's division. Yes. So move I have on to it. that. Yes. The smile is big. Oh, oh, it is big. Yeah, it, was right. a, it was a wonderful. You're a globe-trotting person. I right? am. I <laughs> am and have been. Yeah. I um always was interested as growing up in, in my church as a child in um, how the church lived its life in different parts of the world. So that was always an interest. And again, I was elected as the national president. Um, and that was really uh, a wonderful experience for me, particularly because in 1974, I attended my first uh, women's assembly for our organization, uh, 10,000 women. And it was in the fall of it was in the fall, the only one that was ever held in the fall. And it happened to have been held on October sixth, which was my birthday. And I remember looking up at the stage at the national president and wondering, Oh my goodness, how can somebody stand up here and talk to ten thousand people the way she's doing? Never in and we were in Cincinnati, Ohio. N never ever imagined that twenty one years later I would be on the same stage. <laughs> it, it was it had rotated back to Cincinnati again. <laughs> and that I would be the national president. So uh, whenever I'm at any meeting, I always look in the audience and think, somebody sitting here is going to be responsible for <laughs> carrying this organization forward. And uh, I never would have guessed it would have been me, but there were so many. Um, and I will say this, this is a tribute to, uh, I, I believe, being a Hoosier and particularly uh, being so involved with Purdue. Uh, like many organizations, you come through a regional system, and so I had been the uh, I had been a, a, a regional president here in the state of Indiana. And then I had been the state president, uh, and then a jurisdiction president, and then on to national president. But in each case, in our church, and as in many organizations, uh, Indiana produces some really good leaders. And I think again, it's what Dr. Sinish had said some long time ago. There's this wonderful merger uh, of kind of Midwestern common sense and organization and good fiscal stewardship, but with a lot of space for creativity. Sure. And that combination is really good for an organization. You know, and they so really, it's well, it's needed. Yes, it's needed. So that you have a wonderful respect for preserving what is past, but you know also how to use that. And you don't have a fear of moving forward in the future. You don't have that fear of change. And that the two can live together. Uh, and I think that has really caused us to produce some very right. good leaders. Did you have to do a lot of travel with that? I did. Oh. I did. I traveled all over the world. Um, and I saw Any things. particular one that sticks in your mind on a spot that you stopped at? Yes. Oh. Um, two, actually. But one was um, 
I went to uh, visit a project in Indonesia that had been a water project. We had helped dig a lot of, provided the funding for digging wells. And for so many women uh, in that part of the country, as well as in much of Africa, you know, even though they're, you know, two different parts of the, the world, a woman's day begins early in the morning, uh, getting up, walking miles to get water, coming back to make the family meal, going to back to get more water, coming back. So, so water, you know, we're so used to turning the tap on and, you know, having this instant water, instant clean water. And so, um, so when we dealt the, had these wet wells that were dug, to us, it didn't seem to be such a great thing. Well, you know, here's a, a few dollars, you can have a well, but the way that changed someone's life. And for oh, me, yeah. one of the things that was very um, meaningful is there was a whole celebration to that people in this one village gave to thank us for what we had done. And on one hand, I wanted to be gracious, I mean, I, I hope I was still gracious, to graciously receive their thank you because it was, it was offered that way. But on the other hand, I felt um, almost ashamed in the sense of saying no one should have to thank somebody else for a small cup of clean water. Um, and so always trying to be uh, as gracious, gracious and, appreciative. and appreciative and at the same time saying, I want everybody to have the opportunity to have clean water and, uh, and health and those things. That, that has been a, a driving force for me. Sure, right. Mm -hmm. And was there another spot that you were Yes, yeah, another right. one, um, too, that, I, um, was in that, that has stayed with me. I was in West Africa, and I happened to have been in Sierra Leone, and it was in a case where there was, um, had just been some real severe, uh, it was right after the war, a lot of things had happened, and there was a baby. I went to visit a maternity clinic, and as we were leaving and coming through a, a kind of a garage area, I heard this noise, and there was a baby that was laying on a, um, a scale to be weighed. And the, the nurse said, you know, we just don't have any other, we, we just have no other place for this child to be. And so its mother had, uh, they believe its mother had left it just on the side of the road. And, uh, and so this, uh, this orphan child that was just left, and I thought, I need to scoop this baby up and take it back with me. Uh, and the nurse said that, that they were, someone would probably take the child. But um, that always stuck in my mind because, one, I thought, what is the space between when you think you should do something and the decision you make to do it or not to do it? And, uh, and just how fragile, how fragile life is for so many people. Right. And then I looked at that nurse and I knew she had, she had taken care of that. But to watch people who make, um, I mean, I think many of us do, we, we do our part, but some people it is their passion to go much further. And so um, that experience always made me very appreciative for those people who, who have seemed to go the extra mile right. in how they help humanity. Right. And it sticks with you too. It and does. You carry it forward. It yeah, does. That's right. The uh, uh, the you were the first executive director of the Hannah Center. How did I that was. come about? Oh, yes. it was. It was, again. It was uh, <laughs> one of those. You know I me. Mean? I have these moments in time. Um, <laughs> Hannah was here. I was had just come back to uh, to Lafayette. I was here in grad school, and so Hannah needed an executive director and. Like many social service agencies, they just didn't have very much money, They, particularly to hire what they really needed done. And so uh, one of the members was talking to me about this, and I thought, well, why don't I apply? Because um, I would have done it as a volunteer, I think, but uh, it fits in what I do in terms of organizational development, and I would be willing to do it for a very brief period of time, uh, no more than a year as a way of being able to get some things launched until and they could be looking until they could look and and do some of the resources bec and uh and I could work much of the um work into the schooling that I was doing so it was it was a really good fit and I was really pleased to get the create the Ebony and Ivory Ball which is still, still going. going right done yeah, very still well still going and doing a few things like that yeah. and so it it did give the organization some time and space and to start thinking about what do you need to do in a director how, with a director? How do you get your resources together? How might you do some of these places, do some of these things? And so for me, it felt like a good way to contribute. But um, 
I'm always confident when I'm on the right track, when I'm learning more than I'm teaching, because that's what a good teacher does. There you, know, you go. Yeah, you just learn way more than you could ever <laughs> right. give back. You get a lot else. more out than you put in. You there do. you go. All right. Then you've been doing some, oh, you do some consulting, too. Do you want to just make a couple comments on sure. that? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I've done uh, quite a bit of consulting. You have your own firm. I do. Right. I do, and do uh, work for... Um, um, churches, textbook companies, businesses, most of the things that relate to um, race and diversity issues as well as gender issues, do a lot of things with that. And then just basic um, mentoring and coaching. Um, so many people are um, starting That's needed. work. Yeah, they need that. And oftentimes businesses and corporations just haven't gotten to the overall coaching for everybody and sometimes and people need different things so how do you set up a, a system that allows a person to be coached on just what they need not you know everything that's out there so. and so that's a do you do that nationally or uh nationally and internationally yeah that's probably gives you some more travel there it right? does okay the um <clears throat> you're a trustee at bennett college yes Tell i had just finished yeah oh, okay. bennett college is one of the um historically um black colleges it is a women's institution. It and Spelman are the two African American women's colleges. Um, enjoyed that very much. It's in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, how, about how large a school is it? Uh, it's it's a pretty small school. The enrollment is about twelve hundred. So it's um, it's small compared to Purdue. It's large compared to other schools, <laughs> to right? Other exactly. schools of its, and of it's, its uh, there are many private or uh, women's colleges that fall within that That's same enrollment right. rise. And they really pride <coughs> themselves on. Um, educating a lot of young women who go on to do uh, just extraordinary things. Uh, they call themselves the Bennett Bells. One of the uh, great pleasures I had while I was on the board, uh, I did receive the Bell Ringer Award, but also was to be at a meeting where the the golden bells and the silver bells and the diamond bells came back. These are alumni who have been out of school um, 75 years, which was very few, the 50 years and, and oh, the 25 that's years. That's a nice way to do it. And it was, it was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Yeah, that's very, okay. Now, uh, tell us a couple of professional associates. You were on the Board of Directors of United Way and American Red Cross. And right. Uh, Indian International Reading Association is a professional organization. Uh, I'm National Council of Black Studies, of course, is, fits in my area. Uh, Phi Delta Kappa Educational Honorary. Uh, in recent years, I've moved in some new organizations that I hadn't been in previously because they fit the diversity work. So, um, what would be an example? Of uh, the National Association of uh, Chief Diversity Officers of Higher Education, which is, uh, again, very much related to the kind of work that I do now. And they're related to the American Council of Education. And then the same thing with the, uh, there's a group now that's a professional organization that's called, uh, that started off as the CIC Diversity Officers, but again, it's for people who really are interested in diversity work in higher right. education. Well, that keeps you very busy. It does. Right. It does. Uh, how about some awards and honors? I'm going to start off with the um, YWCA, the Salute to Women. Yes, that and was. I have often ask people, how did you find out about it? Uh, I think I got a call. Okay. I got a call about it. Uh, yes, I did get a call because they needed pictures and bio, and I'm going, really? I got selected? I, I've nominated people before. Um, I've gotten a lot of awards, and sure time, someone, but, you know, you. Uh, it's really nice to get them at home. Uh, I've received awards in, uh, award in the Philippines. I've received an award in Germany. I've received an award in Finland uh, for, again, work that I, I've done with non-government organizations. Um, like I said, the Bennett Bellringer Award. I, there was a, a national, uh, well, I guess it's an international symposium that's named in my honor that brings together um, grassroots women activists, uh, women who are professors in theological schools, and uh, women who are professors and are staff members of uni U.S. colleges uh, to really come together and talk about uh, current issues, particularly the, the last one was on globalization. So that was, um, to have a whole symposium named in your honor for perpetuity is just, that was very Very special. Yeah. Where is the headquarters of this? Uh, oh, that one's headquartered in New York. Oh. So. Mm -hmm. And that was a nice surprise for you? It really was. It really was. <laughs> um, how about uh, any fav uh, favorite Purdue tradition? You got one of those? I, uh, I really do. And Good. It's, um, uh, I do love holidays. And, and I love, you know, I love a lot of things, but I... When the big tree comes into the union, I always, I, I do love that. Um, I really do. Um, 
Do you ever uh, try guessing the number of... Uh, I've often thought of doing that, but I never have. I, well, I yeah, I have too. I've never really. I've never I never really filled out the slip. Them. Yeah, but one that isn't so much a official tradition. It just kind of happens. When I moved to uh, Bearing Hall, um, one of the treats in the fall is that every afternoon about uh, five ten, the band comes back from practicing and they they play all the way back and they they come you know down 3rd street and my office was right there and uh there's just something about the Purdue band that just is uh, I agree. Yeah, it really is and and you know so it would only be a few moments of of, of music but just enough to catch but it. But just enough that you had your you know it just reminds you this is Purdue. That's right. Yeah. Uh how about an outstanding event in your life? Oh, um, you probably have several, which is fine. Yeah, I I I, I do, but um, I think outstanding events have generally been around family. Uh, even though I've had lots of, you know, I've been to the White House and been all those kind of things, but there, but for me, it really have been um, just family gatherings. Uh, I, when our family gets together, it's not. Often and, and as people die off, you know that doesn't. Happen. But when we do, it's uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, They're most of them still in the Indianapolis area. Or yes, Canada. most are still in the Indianapolis area, and so uh, and I think it's just the um, the relaxation and the the laughing together and picking up where just wherever you left off, even if that conversation was two years ago or three years ago, um, you know that. That, that makes, makes it difference. really nice. It really yeah. does. Right. It really does. Um, let's see. Um, then diver uh, diversity, or just closing comments that you'd like to say. Anything that I'll uh, leave it to you. And also, how about a hobby? Any particular hobby? Oh, well, yes, I love to cook. Okay. Love reading, love cooking. And um, and now I think I do more virtual cooking than I do real cooking. <laughs> you know, I buy a lot of cookbooks for somebody who's not doing a lot of cooking. <laughs> We, we could probably share. Yeah, and watch the Food Network and all these kind of things. So I, I, I do, I do like, uh, do like doing <laughs> that. Um, I would think uh, when it comes to diversity, um, it's just not a problem. It's a wonderful joy. The, to think of how different people are and how each one of those differences is adds something special to humanity that I, I really do believe, uh, whether it's my faith life or my Purdue life, I just believe there's some reason I'm here. And if there's some reason I'm here, there's some reason you're here. And being able to search out and do the great mystery of trying to find out what that is and um, just to enjoy other people. And um, particularly, I remember one of my best, best friends always wanted to be a nurse. And she just couldn't imagine anybody wanting to be a teacher. I always wanted to be a teacher. And I just couldn't imagine being a nurse. And we used to laugh about that because we realized, isn't this wonderful that, that in all of humanity, we each are given certain skills and abilities and passions, and all of us together really make things work right. well. And get it all together. Yeah, it yes, really does. Right. I want to thank you, Carol. This is oh, very nice. Thank My you pleasure. so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. And this concludes the interview. Thank you.